Right, let's pick up where we left off, still talking about the difference between two means in non-paired data, independent samples t-test. So we've gone through the conceptual setup, and we ended up here, that everything boils down to the same as other kinds of tests of means. You've just got this normal or t-shaped distribution of, of something or other. In this case, it's differences between all possible means. The mean in this case of this distribution will always be zero. You, can, you look up some t-critical values just based on a formula that tells you the degrees of freedom. And then you calculate a T observed using some formulas that we give you later. So the process is actually not that complicated. Um, the setup to the process is a little bit more complicated, but the process itself is not. But trying to remember how it got there, well, I don't know how much I should tell you, but I think it's important for you to understand this. Uh, hypothesis tests are always what we found in our data minus what the null hypothesis says we should find on average in our data. So it's always our, expect, our, our observed value minus the null hypothesis expected value, and then all of that standardized into a T or a Z type score by dividing by a standard error. So in this case, what we find in our data is a difference between means. And then the null hypothesis says we should, on average, find zero difference between means. So that zero just subtracts out, and this is our formula for T observed. It's a pretty easy little formula, mean 1 minus mean 2 divided by the standard error. And we'll just, I'll show you what the standard error is. It's an important thing to write down. Uh, you can figure it out from your textbook, although they don't necessarily put everything in one convenient place. Now this is the expected value of all mean 1 minus mean 2s if the null hypothesis were true. So that's why that is zero right there. But no matter how complicated it is in the background, and you should think about that because I'll probably ask you about it on an exam or something, the result is just this small little formula here. So just like everything else, it's a point estimate minus a null hypothesis value divided by a standard error. In this case, remember the, diff the point estimate is a difference between two means, not just a single mean anymore. Now we are estimating a difference, we're not estimating a mean. Now we're estimating what is the difference in the population rather than estimating what is the mean of the population. Startlingly similar, yes, there we go. So this, the um, standard error, it's just a formula, you just have to learn the formula. In this case, the variance of group 1 divided by n1, the variance of group 2 divided by the sample size of group 2. These have to be specified separately because they might be different. You might have a different number of individuals in each group. Now, the, the 1 is just telling you which group this comes from. And s squared, it could either be if somebody gives you, gives you the variance or you calculate the variance, plug that in. But remember, the variance is just the squared standard deviation. So if you just have a standard deviation, then just square that and that'll work. So this is the standard error of the difference. In this case, I wrote it out as mean 1 minus mean 2, but you probably just say SE most of the time. So in order to understand what's going on with all these tests and all these confidence intervals, you need to start thinking about the sampling distribution. And I'm going to start testing you on this. This is important. Sampling distributions are critical. You have to know which sampling distribution is being referred to. You don't need to be able to know all the calculus to specify it or whatever, but you need to know things like the mean and the standard deviation and stuff like that. You need to know what it's made up of. So these are the kinds of things you should know about a sampling distribution. You should know what it's made of. Is it made of all possible sample means? Or so far we have these two possibilities. Or all possible differences between two sample means. What raw score distributions did these originally start as? So what were the raw materials that were used to create the values in the sampling distribution? Was it the distribution of raw scores implied by the null hypothesis? We've also seen the distribution implied by the alternative hypothesis. And then we've also seen for confidence intervals that the raw score distribution that we're assuming is just kind of the best guess raw score distribution for the population based on what we find in the sample. We just kind of try and guess what's in the population. And what is the mean of this sampling distribution? What's the expected value? On average, what should the value of all these things in the sampling distribution be if we were to keep you know, to keep sampling infinite number of times and calculating whatever it is. It might be the expected value if the null hypothesis is true, or if the alternative is true, or it could just be the sample mean. So for confidence intervals, we just say it's the sample mean. Or we'll see differences between means too. What is the standard deviation of this distribution? It's always the standard error. There's always a formula. So just know the formula. Now for hypothesis tests, you always have the distribution that is implied by the null hypothesis and the, exp and the mean is the expected value if the null hypothesis is true and then the standard error of course you just calculate the standard error. For a one sample hypothesis test you have all possible sample means. For a two sample hypothesis test you have uh, 
all possible differences between two sample means. For confidence intervals, you have your best guess for the population based on the sample. And this says mean. That's a small error. It should say mean 1 minus mean 2 or mean. So for a difference between means, this is going to be not just the sample mean, but also but the uh, difference between two sample means. But anyway, it's the value from your sample, our best estimate. So the confidence intervals, we go with the best estimate of what's going on in the population from our sample. And for a one sample mean, then that sampling distribution is composed of all possible sample means. And for a two sample situation, the confidence interval of the difference between two sample means, you have all possible differences between two sample means that compose this. And then for power analysis, you have both the null and the alternative distributions. The expected value of the null or the alternative are true. But then in all of these, the constant is standard error. They all have the standard error just calculated by the standard error formula. You can do a power analysis for single mean hypothesis tests or for the difference between two sample means. Either way, you're going to be using the same distributions and the same standard error. So we could put this into a little funky gigantic chart here. So this row tells you what the point estimate is. This tells you what the mean of the sampling distribution is. This tells you what the standard deviation of the sampling distribution is. And this tells you the, what the raw score distribution was imagined to be. So for a single sample mean, all possible sample means, for two sample means. So this is the same. There's no barriers, no lines in here because for a hypothesis test, confidence interval, or power analysis, all this is the same and it's always the standard error. The differences are the mean and what raw score distribution we imagine they came from. It, this could be a handy thing to print out and hang on to. I don't know. So for difference between two independent sample means, the point estimate is the difference between two means. The sampling distribution is the distribution of all possible differences if the null hypothesis is true. The mean is the expected or the mean of all possible differences if the null hypothesis is true, which turns out to be the same as mu1 minus mu2, which turns out to be zero. Anyway, it's zero. You, just, you can just skip to that part that says it's zero. And what's the standard error? There's a funky formula. Here's the, oh, yeah. Realistically, we'll never use t. What am I talking about? I'm a crazy man. This is what happens when you find and replace without checking all the finding and replacing that you're doing. Realistically, we'll never use z, is what I meant to say. So this is going to always be the t standard error. And there's a different standard error for independent samples tests than there is for paired samples tests. So step by step, it's the same as before. You write out your hypotheses, you draw and label a graph, you find a t critical, you calculate the observed, compare those two, make a decision, reject the null or not, and then state your conclusion. Same process as before. So here's the altogether formula for t observed. Because remember, it's just mean 1 minus mean 2 over the standard error. Well, I just plug in the standard error formula there. Instead of writing SE, I just put it all there. So if you want to calculate t observed for an independent samples t-test, that's it. That's the t observed. And the degrees of freedom to look up your t-critical are the smaller. So min parentheses means the smaller of whatever is in between the commas. So the smaller of n minus n1 minus 1 or n2 minus 1. As you can see, this is not rocket science. Um, although I imagine rocket scientists use t-tests quite a lot from time to time. So talking about, you can ignore this if you want to, just do what the textbook says, but if you want to know some of the details behind there, if you're going to continue on in stats, you should know that this little quirk is going to happen. Most textbooks would not say this is the degrees of freedom. They'd say n1 plus n2 minus 2, but that's for the pooled standard error. And our textbook is freaked out by the pooled standard error. There's a different formula for the pooled standard error. It says, oh my gosh, don't use the pooled standard error unless you're absolutely sure, blah, blah, blah. Most textbooks say go ahead and use it unless there's some serious problem with the conditions or sample sizes are totally different or variances are different or something. Just do what the textbook says. Just follow the formulas that I'm giving you. And then when someone gives you a different textbook, follow their formulas. All right, so here's an example. Anxiety scores and treatments. Let's say your treatment group, you got some people who get an actual treatment for, a, for their anxiety, uh, people who get a placebo treatment. Now in therapy, the placebo treatment is often just talking to somebody, but not about your symptoms, just kind of talking to a friend. So did the treatment cause a change in test scores that was different from the placebo? These are two separate groups of individuals, and we can look at the values right here. We've got um, a mean of 68.44 on that anxiety score scale 
for the treatment group and a lower mean for the placebo group. So, hmm, let's assume that these anxiety scores are like lack of anxiety, otherwise we're going to end up finding that the treatment group made you worse. I don't think I intended that. So let's say this is lack of anxiety. So higher scores mean you're less anxious, mean you're happier, a happier person. Here's the standard deviation of each of these. Right? Why don't I have my mean? In this? Anyway, this is the mean, and these are the standard deviations of this. don't know why that animation failed for me right now. So a hypothesis would be null hypothesis. There's no difference in outcome, no difference in anxiety scores. Alternative, let's do a two-tailed test. The treatment results in a different average post-treatment anxiety score than the placebo does. So the null hypothesis, uh, the mean of all possible treatment scores that could have happened minus placebo scores that could have happened, anxiety scores would be zero. The alternative is that they're not zero. The equivalent, you could just say, you know, population mean one equals population mean two or doesn't equal, rather than doing the minus. The minus helps to keep things straight since it's actually a difference between scores that we're dealing with. So here's a graph. You're going to have two-tailed, alpha equals 0.05. Doesn't it look just exactly like all the other graphs we've done? Yeah, there we go. There's your graph. And looking up T-critical with very faded letters. Anyway, alpha equals 0.05 and two tails. That's going to give us a critical alpha of 2.26 with nine degrees of freedom. There are 10 individuals in each group, and so uh, 10 minus one for one group, 10 minus one for the other group. The smaller of those two is, is the same, 10 minus one, so it's nine. So plus and minus 2.26 is going to be our critical, um, our T critical. So we've got T critical minus and plus 2.26. So we're all set up. All we have to do is calculate a T observed now. So we just have to use this formula. Let's assume we remember how to use it. We plug in all our values here, follow along if you like, and we find that our T observed is a positive 1.98. So, uh, T observed doesn't quite make it. No significant difference here. We are not in the rejection region. Our difference between means was not as extreme as you would have needed to find in order to reject the null hypothesis. It wasn't extreme enough. So we are not in the rejection region with our T observed, so we fail to reject the null, and our conclusion might be something like there's no statistically significant difference between the effectiveness of the treatment and the placebo. T with nine degrees of freedom is 1.98, that's our T observed and the degrees of freedom we used. P is greater than 0.05. P greater than just feels like failure typing that. So looking at these tests again, just a reminder, I supposed to say Z still, sorry. I did a find and replace with T for Z. Yeah, it was a bad choice. Anyway, we're just going to use T-tests. That's what we're going to use from here on out. So there's actually a bunch of little formulas, but you don't have to memorize these. We'll get into these. You don't have to write these down yet. You know this one. You know this one. You know that. You don't know the means of two paired groups, but now you know the means of two independent groups. You'll learn this in a later lecture. No worries.